Welcome to Bless Man Meditations. My name is Andy. On this YouTube channel, I offer thoughtful responses to skeptical objections to the Christian faith. I likewise edify the saints by equipping them to provide an answer for the hope that lies within them. I hope that you find value in my work. Please like my videos, send me comments, and please subscribe. Let's work together to contend earnestly for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Today on Blessed Man Meditations, we continue our look at Paul Copan's Is God a Moral Monster? in which we make sense of the Old Testament God. These are the contents of Is God a Moral Monster? by Paul Copan. Please pause the video to take a closer look. Here's Paul Copan, um, Ledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic in Florida. Written or edited over 20 apologetics and philosophy books lives in Florida. Chapter 15, we begin our look at the issue of how God dealt with the Canaanites. There's going to be a multiple part uh, look at the Canaanites in Is God a Moral Monster? This is part one. Copan begins by saying, probably the most difficult Old Testament ethical issue is the divine command to kill the Canaanites. God issued to his people Israel. Theologian turned atheist Gerd Ludemann wrote that the command to exterminate is extremely offensive. End quote. I've heard uh, William Lane Craig uh, refer to Ludemann or even quote Ludemann in some of his speeches. So this line that Ludemann wrote, the command to exterminate is extremely offensive. This, this line is a far cry from the merciful God frequently proclaimed in Scripture. Consider just one of these passages from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 16 to 18. It says, but, if the, but of the cities of these peoples, which the Lord your God gives you in inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. But you shall utterly destroy them, the Hivite, the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. That's Deuteronomy 10, verses 16 to 18. God is calling his people to not fall into what the Canaanites have fallen into. This issue of how God dealt with the Canaanites is a tough question, and Copan will take four chapters to tackle this and related issues. This is the first of four chapters. First, Copan in this chapter will review some introductory matters. Then Copan will address two possible scenarios regarding the Canaanite issue. And finally, Copan will look at the question of religion, whatever that term means, and violence. So first, were the Canaanites that wicked? According to the biblical text, Yahweh was willing to wait about 430 years because the sin of the Amorite, which was a Canaanite people group, has not yet reached its limit. That was Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. So God's waiting 430 years before he does anything to the Canaanites. In other words, in Abraham's day, the time was not ripe for judgment on the Canaanites. The moment was not ripe for them to be driven out out and for the land to vomit them out, as Leviticus 18.25 says. Sodom and Gomorrah, on the other hand, were ready for judgment. Not even ten righteous people could be found in Sodom and Gomorrah. Even earlier, at the time of Noah, humans had similarly hit rock bottom. That's just after Genesis 6.5, where uh, the Lord says, right uh, yeah, leading up to the flood where the Lord says uh, that people are exceedingly wicked. Despite 120 years of Noah's preaching, no one outside of Noah's family listened. That's one of my arguments for God's character. Um, God seems, yes, he does bring the flood that kills everybody other than Noah and those of Noah's family who were inside the ark. But it says that in the New Testament that Noah was a preacher of righteousness 
that's what that reference to Second Peter two five refers to, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and so that meant for the for the hundred and twenty years that Noah spent building the ark, he was preaching righteousness to those who would were with an earshot of his construction project, and nobody repented. Now that is a vivid illustration of the sinfulness of human hearts and their unwillingness or inability, whatever you want to call it, to respond to the gospel in, in effect. I mean, that, that, that was a, a foretaste of the gospel. Noah's preaching was a foretaste of the gospel. Enter the ark and avoid God's judgment. Don't enter the ark and receive God's judgment. Put your faith in Christ and avoid God's judgment. Don't put your faith in Christ and receive God's judgment. It's, a, it's, a, it's analogous to the preaching of the gospel in that sense. Noah's contemporaries were also ripe for judgment. But it was only after Israel's lengthy enslavement in Egypt that the time was finally ripe for, ripe for the Israelites to enter Canaan because of the wickedness of these nations. Sometimes God simply gives up on nations, cities, or individuals when they've gone past a point of no return. Judgment, whether directly or indirectly, is the last resort. So what kind of wickedness are we talking about when it relates to the Canaanites? Well, we are familiar with the line that the apple does not fall far from the tree. In the case of the Canaanites, the Canaanites' moral apples didn't fall far from the tree of their pantheon of immoral gods and goddesses. So if the Canaanite deities engaged in incest, then it's not surprising that incest wasn't treated as a serious moral wrong among the Canaanite people. Incest was not treated as a moral wrong among the Canaanite people, where most listening to this would consider incest to be a serious moral wrong. As we've seen, adultery, temple sex, bestiality, homosexual acts, also temple sex, and child sacrifice were also permitted by these Canaanites. Humans are imaging beings designed to reflect the likeness and glory of their creator. If we worship the creaturely rather than the creator, we'll come to resemble or image the idols of our own devising and that in which we place our security. The sexual acts of the gods and goddesses were imitated by the Canaanites as a kind of magical act. The more sex on the Canaanite high places, the more this would stimulate the fertility god Baal to have sex with his consort Anath, which meant more semen or rain produced to water the earth. Here's a picture of Anath on the left and then two representations of Baal. Let's add this to the bloodlust and violence of the Canaanite deities. Anath, the patroness of both sex and war, reminds us of the bloodthirsty goddess Kali of Hinduism, who drank her victim's blood and sat surrounded by corpses. She's commonly depicted with a garland of skulls around her neck. The late archaeologist William Albright describes the Canaanite deity Anath's massacre in the following gory scene. There's William Albright on the bottom left. Albright says, quote, The blood was so deep that she waded in it up to her knees, nay, up to her neck. Under her feet were human heads above her. Human hands flew like locusts. In her sensuous delight, she decorated herself with suspended heads while she attached hands to her girdle. Her joy at the butchery is described in even more sadistic language. Her liver swelled with laughter. Her heart was full of joy. The liver of Anath was full of exultation. Afterwards, Anath was satisfied and washed her hands in human gore before proceeding to other occupations. End quote from Albright. Canaanite idolatry was not simply an abstract theology or personal interest carried out in the privacy of one's home. 
Canaanite, Canaanite idolatry was a worldview that profoundly influenced Canaanite society. It permeated everything they did. Just like today, our worldview, worldviews permeate everything we do. Hopefully, Christians are not so conformed to this world, but are rather transformed by the renewing of their minds that their worldview sufficiently influences their lifestyle such that they are lights in this dark world, such that the world may see their good works that say, that they let so shine before men that the world may see their good works and glorify the Father in heaven. But the Canaanite worldview profoundly influenced Canaanite society. Given this paganized Canaanite society, it's no wonder God didn't want the Israelites to associate with the Canaanites and be led astray from obedience to the one true God. This is why you see uh, constant warnings in the Old Testament for God to for God's people to separate from the wicked nations surrounding them. This is why you see the New Testament calls for the Christian to put off the deeds of darkness and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. God wanted to have Israel morally and theologically separate from the peoples around them. God wants Christians today to be morally and theologically separate from the peoples around them who want nothing to do with him. In other words, the land of Canaan was no paradise before the Israelites got to Canaan. Israel had no inherent rights to inhabit the land as an undeserved gift from God, and neither did the Canaanites have a right to remain in the land. In fact, both the Canaanites and the Israelites would experience partial removal from their land because of their wickedness. Can uh, Copan is not arguing that the Canaanites were the worst specimens of humanity that ever existed. Nor is Copan arguing that the Canaanites won the, um, the immorality contest for worst behaved people in the ancient Near East. That said, the evidence for profound moral corruption was abundant. God considered the Canaanites ripe for judgment, which would be carried out in keeping with God's saving purposes in history. Some argue that God is intolerant, commanding people to have no other gods before him. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, there he begins the Ten Commandments and says that you shall have no other gods before me. They state that uh, the, the, those that argue that God is intolerant state that Israel's laws illustrate the denial of religious freedom at the heart of, of Israelite religion. Yes, they, the... Uh, New Atheist will say that Israel's laws uh, do not lend themselves to religious freedom. But they fail, the New Atheists, the enemies of God, fail to consider that God is jealous in the sense that he wants his people to be solely devoted to him. Much like a husband would be rightly jealous if the husband knew that his wife was being tempted to go astray with another man. That married man would be jealous for the devotion and affection for his wife. And this is analogous to the God of the Bible being jealous for the devotion of his people. And didn't other ancient Near Eastern religions value religious diversity? Couldn't non-Israelites worship whatever god they wanted? Israel had committed itself to be faithful to Yahweh, as in any good marriage, spouses shouldn't play the field in the name of marital freedom. That's what I was just saying a moment ago. As for the Canaanites, God judged them not only because they happened to worship idols, but also because of the corrupting moral practices and influences bound up in idolatry. Notice that God judges the nations listed in Amos chapter 1 and 2, not because they don't worship Yahweh, but because of the outrageous moral acts. Copan has already addressed the topic of divine jealousy, but Copan will come back to some of these themes later. So was God just picking on the Canaanites, but not on other peoples? No. Yahweh frequently threatened many na nations with judgment when they crossed a certain moral threshold. 
For example, in Amos chapter 1 and 2, God promised to send fire on nations surrounding Israel for their treacheries and barbarities. And he promised the same to Israel and Judah. Later, Jesus himself pronounced final judgment on nationalistic Israel, which would face its doom in AD 70 at the hands of the Romans in Matthew 24. What's more, we moderns shouldn't think that severe divine judgment was only for biblical times, as though God no longer judges nations today. Despite many gains over the centuries in areas of human rights and religious liberty, due to positive influence of biblical ideals in America and other Western nations, Westerners have their own share of decadence, and we may resemble the Canaanites more than we realize. We should proceed cautiously about what counts for direct divine judgment, as we may not be able to determine this precisely. These sorts of acts serve as illustrations of a cosmic final judgment yet to come. Ultimately, God's judgment will come to all who refuse to submit to God's kingdom agenda and instead seek to set up their own little fiefdoms, fiefdoms, however you say that. In the end, humans can have their final divorce from God both as a just judgment as well as the natural fruit born out of a life lived without God. As a last resort, God says to them, Thy will be done. You don't want me? God says, fine. You're going to have some hardship in this life, and you're going to have eternal judgment in the next. Not that a Christian lives a life without hardship. Christians can definitely live lives with hardships. Who determines the point of no return? Israeli psychologist George Tamarin undertook a study in 1966 involving 1,066 schoolchildren ages 8 to 14. Presented with the story of Jericho's destruction, the schoolchildren were asked, Do you think Joshua and the Israelites acted rightly or not? Two-thirds of the children approved. However, when Tamarin substituted General Lin for Joshua and a, and a Chinese kingdom 3,000 years ago for Israel, only 7% approved, while 75% disapproved. The critic is baffled at this. We rightly condemn the killing of an ethnic group when carried out by Nazis or Hutus, but Israel seems to get a pass. Indeed, a divine order when doing the same thing to the Canaanites. That's the critic... What guidelines do we have to determine when a culture is irredeemable beyond the point of no moral and spiritual return? Don't we need something more than mere mortals to assess a culture's ripeness for judgment? I wonder if that should say mere morals. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Aren't these considerations too weighty for humans to judge? Yes, they are. These considerations about who uh, is beyond the point of no moral or spiritual return, uh, these considerations are too weighty for humans to judge. Any such determinations should be left up to God, namely through special revelation. We should let God decide, because these things are very difficult for us to decide. Impossible for us to decide. The Israelites, when they went into battle against the Philistines with the Ark of the Covenant, but without divine approval, were roundly defeated in 1 Samuel chapter 4. The requirement of special revelation before any such undertaking, such as the important undertaking of Israel against the Philistines in 1 Samuel 4, is precisely what we have in Scripture. The requirement of special revelation before any important undertaking is precisely what we have in Scripture. The one true God told his prophet Moses or Samuel when the time was right. Likewise, without such clear divine guidance, Israel wouldn't have been justified in attacking the Canaanite strongholds. They didn't just do it willy-nilly, they did it because God commanded them to because of the wickedness of the Canaanites. They were given a chance to repent. They didn't repent. Some TV stunt shows warn children, kids, don't try this at home. Likewise, we could say about Israel's holy war situation, don't try this without special revelation. These matters aren't up to humans to decide. 
Yahweh-initiated battles were never intended for non-profit organizations. I think that's a sort of a pun there on Paul Copan's part. Think of the disastrous results when Israel attempted to go into other battles without divine approval. Such as in Numbers 15 and Joshua 7. I think Joshua 7 was, was uh, the sins of Achan, possibly. I'd have to look that up. As we've seen already, God's call to battle was unique to Israel's situation. Such a call, though, isn't an enduring, universally binding standard for all time and all cultures. New atheists failed to consider there was something unique going on historically at that time. They treat this issue as though it's as though the Christian thinks that it's a universally binding standard for all time and all cultures. Did the Canaanites know better than to act the way they acted? Some scholars have questioned whether or not we can hold the Canaanites morally accountable. After all, weren't they just practicing their religion, which they received from their parents? Shouldn't God have enlightened them about himself and his requirements for humans? As we look at history, we see that nations and civilizations have been capable of moral reforms and improvements. We shouldn't be surprised at this. After all, God reveals himself to humans through conscience, reason, human experience, and creation. This natural revelation opens the door for moral improvements from one generation to the next. People without the scriptures can still have access to what's good and right. We see that in 21st century America from the irreligious. They have access to what's good and right because they have a conscience, they have reason, they have experience, and they have creation. For a little support, let Copan quote a notable theist and notable atheist. The notable theist is the Apostle Paul, who affirms that special revelation isn't necessary for people to know about God and to recognize right and wrong. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, for, uh, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. The notable atheist philosopher is Kai Nielsen. That's Kai Nielsen on the bottom left. It's more reasonable to believe, Nielsen says, such elemental things as wife beating and child abuse to be evil than to believe any skeptical theory tells us we cannot know or reason to believe, reasonably believe any of these things to be evil. Nielsen goes on, I firmly believe that this is bedrock and right, and that anyone who does not believe it cannot have probed deeply enough into, into the grounds of his moral beliefs, end quote. We've seen how Amos chapters 1 and 2 illustrates these two quotations nicely. God had warned the morally accountable Gentile nations surrounding Israel. Although they knew their moral duties, they disregarded their moral duties. Knowing better, these Gentile nations stifled compassion, suppressed their conscience, and carried out terrible atrocities such as ripping open pregnant women or betraying vulnerable displaced populations into the hands of their enemies. I believe I've heard new atheists claim that God commanded people to do those very things that the Gentile nations did. And um, I think, but those same new atheists who were getting upset at God for commanding Israel to do things like ripping open uh, pregnant women didn't express similar outrage at unbelievers who ripped open pregnant women. I think it's a little hypocritical. The author of Hebrews calls the Canaanites disobedient in Hebrews 11.31. That is, having a moral awareness, but disregarding that moral awareness. In C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, Lewis lists moral codes of many cultures across the ages. 
that are strikingly similar at key points. Honoring parents, being faithful in marriage, not stealing, not murdering, not lying, and so on. In other words, doing the right thing isn't as elusive as some may think. Consider Rahab and her family in Joshua chapter 2. Though immersed in Canaanite culture, they proved to be a clear sign that other Canaanites could potentially have been rescued as well. Israel's God had convincingly delivered his people from Egypt. He had supplied signs and wonders, revealing his reality and surpassing greatness, and the Canaanites were fully aware of this, according to Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 9. Some charge that Rahab was selling out her people to save her own neck. But is that fair? For one thing, Rahab risked a lot by taking in the foreign spies and hiding them. And surely, loyalty to one's race or ethnic group isn't the ultimate virtue, particularly when it goes against what's right and true. Many Afrikaners in South Africa who protested apartheid broke with the traditions of their racially prejudiced ancestors, which was the right thing to do. So was it genocide and ethnic cleansing? According to Richard Dawkins, pictured at left, the killing of the Canaanites was an act of ethnic cleansing in which bloodthirsty massacres were carried out with xenophobic relish, end quote. Were the Israelites truly a xenophobic? That word apparently means fearful of strangers. So were the Israelites fearful of non-Israelites? Terms like genocide and ethnic cleansing Ethnic, yeah, ethnic cleansing evoke negative emotions in all of us. Um, 21st century Americans would think of the Holocaust as modern uh, examples of such genocide and ethnic cleansing. Modern, at least in comparison to uh, the ancient Near East. Dawkins isn't exactly interested in accuracy, however, so Dawkins resorts to misleading rhetoric to sway the jury. Ethnic cleansing is fueled by racial hatred. The alleged in-group pronounces a pox on the out-group and then proceeds to destroy, them, to destroy them. Does this scenario really mesh with the facts about the Israelites, though? As it turns out, xenophobic attitudes don't prompt the Israelites to kill the Canaanites. From the beginning, God told Abraham... All the families on the earth would be blessed through Abraham's offspring. We're not off to a very xenophobic start right there. Then we read many positive things about foreigners in the chapters that follow. Abraham honored foreigner Melchizedek. He encountered just and fair-minded foreign leaders among the Egyptians and the Philistines, who proved to be more honorable than Abraham was himself. A mixed multitude left with Israel from Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. The Passover. Moses married a dark skinned Cushite Ethiopian. So there seems to be a mixing of ethnicities there. I think that's the point, which flies right in the face of what the new atheist claims. There's just an ignorance there that hides, the, there's an ignorance there that prevents one's ability to think th through things clearly. And without looking at these Old Testament issues in a more deep, methodical manner, like Copan is doing in this book, the opportunity for people to form ill-informed emotional opinions and reactions against a surface level incomplete understanding of what's really going on with the text leads to arriving at wrong conclusions, which is what the new atheists do. The Gentile Rahab and her family joined Israel's ranks. So again, mixing, not ethnic cleansing. Um, in contrast to the Israelite Achan, who stole gods from who stole goods from Jericho and was put to death for his disobedience. Also, the very language of dedication to destruction, the ban harem could be applied equally to Israel as it was to a Canaanite city. Later on, Israel's prophets would readily condemn Israel's wickedness as they would that of the surrounding nations. In general, 
God's judgments fall on those practicing evil and wickedness, whether Jew or Gentile, as Paul makes clear in the first three chapters of Romans. God's judgments fall on Jew or Gentile. Sin is the issue, not ethnicity. Furthermore, God also repeatedly commanded Israel to show concern for non-Israelite aliens or sojourners in their midst. Why did God command Israel to show concern for non-Israelites in their midst? Because Israel had been strangers in Egypt. God frequently reminded his people to learn the lessons of their history so they wouldn't be doomed to repeat it with the Gentiles in their midst. Furthermore, according to Israel's civil, civil law, the stranger living in Israel had the same legal rights as the native Israelite. There shall be one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. That's Leviticus chapter 24, verse 22. As we've seen, the alien, one who embraced Israel's covenant and Israel's God, could embrace um, such events, could be embraced, uh, could embrace such, could participate in events such as the Passover. I think that's what that's supposed to say. The alien who embraced Israel's God and in Israel's covenant could participate in events such as the Passover. Negative concerns regarding the foreigner had to do with theological compromise and idolatry. Such negativity wasn't assumed when a non-Israelite like Rahab or Ruth or Uriah embraced Yahweh, the God of Israel. We could add that God exhorted the Israelites to show concern even for their personal enemies, where it says, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you falling down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. That's case law in Exodus uh, chapter 23. What about God allowing Israel uh, to take interest from foreigners, but not from fellow citizens? We've seen that interest was charged to foreigners who were temporary residents and not members of society. That typically, uh, They typically borrowed money to invest in profit-making pursuits and trading ventures. These weren't loans given to help foreigners escape poverty. This regulation had a built-in incentive. The outsider, who didn't have to live in Israel, could choose to become a part of Israel and embrace the one true God. If so, he could benefit from divinely commanded economic per perks and displays of Israelite concern. Instead of hostility, God commanded the Israelites to love and show concern for the, for the resident aliens in their midst. The command to love the resident alien and to treat her the same way as a citizen, like in Leviticus 19, is remarkable and unique in the ancient Near East's religious thoughts and practices. Critics will point to Deuteronomy 23.3. It says, quote, No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. End quote. That doesn't seem very kind. However, earlier in Deuteronomy 2, three nations were favorably mentioned. Edom, related to Israel through Esau, Jacob's brother, and Moab and Ammon, nations from the sons of Abraham's nephew Lot. Notice that Israel's prohibited from fighting against them. So let's not misread 23.3 as xenophobia. That said, God took treachery against Israel very seriously. Genesis 12.3 implies judgment on those who would mistreat Israel. Deuteronomy 23.4 reveals the reason the Ammonites, Moabites exclusion from the assembly. Uh, it says, because they, Deuteronomy 23.4, because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. Numbers chapters 22 through 25. Even so, remember that generations later, Ruth, the Moabitess, was readily received into the midst of Israel. A lot depended on whether the alien from Moab or Ammon fully embraced Israel's covenant, which meant his acceptance into the assembly as a general, genuine worshiper of Yahweh. As John Goldengate writes, quote, being of non-Israelite origin is not a disqualification for membership of the Isra membership of the Israelite community in any period. The question is, what God do you serve? The reason for not marrying a Canaanite is that this will turn you away from following Yahweh and lead you to serving other deities. Deut and uh, according to Deuteronomy seven, a Canaanite who's made a commitment to Yahweh is a different matter. End quote. So we should put to rest this idea of divinely inspired racism or ethnocentrism. In fact, God regularly reminded his people not to get so high and mighty. He frankly told Israel that possessing the land wasn't due to their righteousness or uprightness of heart. It was because of the wickedness of the Canaanites. What's more, God considered the Israelites a stubborn people in Deuteronomy chapter 9. 
the most favored nation status was given with the goal of inviting others to experience God's gracious favor, and God could revoke that status. Likewise, just as he could give the land to a group of wandering landless Israelites as an inheritance, he could revoke it as well. Those in the land, whether Canaanites or Israelites, were only tenants, they were not owners. Copan will explore the phrase utterly destroy below. Suffice it to say here that God's charge to Israel to utterly destroy the cities of the morally bankrupt Canaanites was turned on Israel when groups of Israelites were seduced into following false gods. God was concerned with sin, not ethnicity. In fact, as we read the Old Testament prophets, they, with God, were angered about Israel's disobedience, and they threatened divine judgment on Israel and Judah more often than they did on the pagan nations. The Old Testament prophets did. If we read carefully, it's obvious that God was opposed to Israel's sin. Israel, if we read carefully, it's obvious that God was opposed to Israel's sin just as much as he was to that of their oppressors. So did God use inefficient means? Some critics raise a potentially embarrassing question. If God wanted to destroy the Canaanite religion by removing Canaanite peoples, didn't he fail spectacularly in achieving this purpose? Wasn't Old Testament Israel continually getting sucked into pagan idolatry? Why not a more effective divine judgment? perhaps scorching fire and brimstone to clear the land of Canaanite idolatry so that Israel wouldn't get entangled in, uh, wouldn't get entangled spiritually and morally. Many critics focus on efficiency, that, it, that it's somehow immoral or ungodlike to be less efficient. But what theological reason compels us to assume that God must operate with maximum efficiency? Are we too Western in our assumptions about what God ought to do? Is God obligated to expedite his purposes? Must God be less clunky to reveal his divinity? Don't such questions take for granted knowing God's purposes in detail? Doesn't God seem to think, or excuse me, God doesn't seem to think it's a problem that a small planetary speck is home to all the universe's inhabitants, while the rest of the cosmos is, from all we can see, uninhabited and uninhabitable. Throughout scripture, God took plenty of time and utilize seemingly inefficient means to accomplish his purposes. For instance, God didn't exactly jumpstart the descendants as numerous as the stars program. Rather, he began with a barren elderly couple, Abraham and Sarah, and then continued to work through a stubborn and rebellious nation. Biblical categories such as grace, covenant faithfulness, relationship, obedience, perseverance, and love are the more relevant, relevant considerations. Relevant considerations. Efficiency doesn't seem to figure in all that prominently. As a friend of Copan says, God is always almost late. The scriptures reveal a sufficient God, not necessarily an efficient God. And the question of efficiency revolves around what the particular goal is. Efficient to do what and to exclude what exactly? Getting Hot house-grown tomatoes from your supermarket may be efficient, but if maximal satisfaction is uppermost in your mind, then growing tomatoes in your backyard and enjoying their vine-ripened taste would be the way to go. Yes, it's more work and time, but the results are far more enjoyable and tasty. Why then didn't God make sure that no Canaanite was left in the land just to make sure that Israel wouldn't be lured by the lifestyle encouraged by Canaan's idolatry? The scriptures reveal a God who works through messy, seemingly inefficient processes, including human choices and failures. Like in Genesis 50, verse 20, where Joseph says about his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, to accomplish his redemptive purposes in history. God uses inefficient processes, including human choices and failures to accomplish his redemptive purposes in history. That humans see God's grace, holiness, and love as more of a priority than efficiency. The root God chose didn't require the death of every last Canaanite. Not only were the Canaanites sufficiently driven out so as to not decisively undermine Israel's spiritual and moral integrity in the long run, but, as Copan will show, Can uh, Canaanites participate in God's redemptive plan both in the Old and the New Testaments. Despite occasional spiritual revivals and moral successes in Israel's history, her failure to eradicate idolatry led to many troubles. She paid for her, co her compromises with, with an Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom and then a Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom. 
theological and moral threat of the foreign religion, however, didn't so damage Israel that its monotheism and covenantal awareness were totally eclipsed. By the first century AD, the theological stage had been sufficiently set. Israel's scriptures were preserved, her national identity forged, her temple worship restored, her messianic expectations rekindled, and her monotheistic dedication secured. Despite Israel's compromises and rebellions over the centuries, Jesus' arrival on the scene came in the fullness of time. Is this sufficient? Not in an obvious way. Was it sufficient? Very much so. Let's look at cosmic warfare. The worship of idols wasn't innocent or harmless. The Old Testament connects idolatry with demonic, that is, with the cosmic enemies of God who rebelled against him. Goat demons, strange gods, demons, gods, demons, idols. Even, uh, uh, even Pharaoh, the earthly representation of Egypt's gods, was a picture of cosmic opposition. So in the Exodus, Yahweh is the cosmic warrior who engages the evil powers of Egypt and the forces that inspire them. The New Testament picks up on this theme in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Ephesians. God's act of engaging in battles is not for the sake of violence or even victory, but as such to establish peace and justice. God commands Israel to wipe out Canaan's idols and false immoral worship. God's commands um, to Israel to wipe out Canaan's idols and false immoral worship illustrate cosmic warfare between Yahweh and the dark powers opposed to his rule. The theme of spiritual warfare is certainly more per, uh, pronounced in the New Testament, which clearly exposes Satan and his hosts as the ultimate enemies of God and his kingdom's advance. Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, is a warrior who opposes all that mars the divine image in humans and all that threatens human flourishing and all that sets itself in opposition to God's righteous reign. Yahweh wars aren't simply a clash between this and that deity. They represent a clash of two world orders, one rooted in reality and justice and the other rooted in reality, denial, and brute power, one representing creational order and the other representing, ant representing anti-creation. Israel's taking Canaan, then, is unlike the general Lynn analogy in which a stronger nation happens to invade and overpower a weaker nation. This would rightly draw the reaction, what gives the stronger nation the right? So perhaps we should think more along the lines of the Sicilian police invading a mafia stronghold to remove a corrupting network of crime so that citizens can live in peace rather than in fear. Just as the plagues in Egypt were a demonstration of Yahweh's judgment on her gods, so Israel's wars revealed God's sovereign rule over the presumed gods of the nations. In Israel's officially sanctioned wars, God's supernatural power and supremacy were revealed. God didn't allow Israel to have a standing army, uh, such as David's unlawful census in 2 Samuel 24. Israel's wars weren't for professionals, but for amateurs and volunteers. Fighting, however, wasn't for the faint-hearted or for those distracted by other concerns. Those lacking courage or who had other reasons for not wanting to fight were allowed, even invited, to excuse themselves from battle. Soldiers fighting in a Yahweh war weren't paid, nor could they take personal plunder, unlike warfare tactics elsewhere in the ancient Near East. Kings, tribal leaders, and high priests weren't authorized to call for a war, only a prophet through divine revelation. Victories for Israel's mainly ragtag army clearly signaled that God was fighting on their behalf. Uh, 2 Chronicles 20 In Old Testament Israel's physical battles, God wanted to show forth his greatness, not a display of sheer human power. Although the true Israel, the church, doesn't wage war against flesh and blood uh, today, our warfare against Satan and his hosts has its roots in Yahweh's wars in the Old Testament. Well, that concludes chapter 15. Next time, chapter 16, we'll continue the look at the Canaanites um, with part two of the series on the Canaanites. So, thank you for tuning in today on Blessed Man Meditations. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Please consider supporting this ministry through the purchase of the published work, the commentary on the 30 chapters of the Book of Psalms. Uh, please, uh, again, like, comment, and subscribe. Pray for this ministry, and uh, hope you have a blessed rest of your day.